Welcome back to Cap Chicago on WNDZ, 750 AM, 312-255-8408. Father Greg Sackwitz and Mark Teresi here in Chicago. And the Great Chicago Fire premieres Friday, October 9th, which is tomorrow at 8 p.m. on WTTW. It's a Chicago Stories original documentary. It takes a look at the Great Chicago Fire of 1871 and explores how Chicagoans faced destruction, rebuilt the city, and prepared for the new thriving future. Let's listen to a clip from the documentary which will air tomorrow evening. But no one felt the devastation of the Great Chicago Fire like Catherine O'Leary. The fire had started in her barn. A successful dairy owner, O'Leary claimed she was asleep when the blaze erupted. I was in bed, myself and my husband and five children when this fire commenced. I guess it was my husband got outside the door and he ran back to the bedroom and said, Kate, the barn is a fire. Yet even before the ground had cooled, a local newspaper accused O'Leary of an unimaginable crime, that she started the fire that destroyed her city. A tremendous clip. And with us on the program this morning, Dan Protest, executive producer, WTTW television. Dan, welcome to the program this morning. Thanks so much for having me. I saw the clip that was sent to me by Vince Girasoli and a couple minute clip. It is outstanding. Uh, In fact, did the fire begin, was it 149 years ago today? 149 years ago, uh, yes, tonight at about, let's see, about 8.39 p.m., uh, Catherine O'Leary had uh, just stocked her barn on the near west side uh, full of hay, went to bed, and was having trouble sleeping because her neighbors were entertaining some guests from Ireland and uh, playing the fiddle. The fiddle music was keeping her up, and then next thing she knew, uh, her husband was yelling and saying, Kate's barn is is a fire. And um, that's, of course, uh, just about all we know is that it started in her barn at 8.39 p.m. What we don't know is how it started, but of course the myth for many, many years was that Catherine O'Leary had been out there uh, milking her cow, which of course no, no one ever does at night, mm-hmm. uh, and that the cow kicked over the lantern and that she was responsible for starting the fire. And that myth was um, persisted you know, for until 1997, uh, when she was finally officially cleared uh, by the City Council of Chicago. And that's one of the things we really wanted to unpack with this documentary is why is it? Be- because, in fact, she was cleared in her lifetime. There was an inquest right after the fire uh, that she was interviewed. All these other witnesses were interviewed, and it was made completely clear that she was not responsible for the fire. And yet she was Certainly when I was a kid growing up in the Chicago area, we always heard she was responsible. And the reason why she was blamed for so many years wrongly um, was really wrapped up in a lot of anti-Irish and anti-Catholic sentiment. Now, Dan, you're a his- by, by virtue of the work you do, you're a historian and you're also a storyteller. And how- what attracted you to this? This is a very focused program uh, to to kind of bring some clarity to this story. What what attracted you to this? So um, I've been producing uh, TV shows for WTTW for 21 years now, and many of those 21 years have been focused on Chicago history. So uh, I know Chicago hi- history pretty well. I'm pretty passionate about it. And yet the Great Chicago Fire is one of those subjects that kind of steered away from, maybe in a way because it seemed just a little too obvious. You know, it's it's actually, when you think of Chicago history, you think of the 1893 World's Fair, and you think of the Great Chicago Fire. It's one of the first maybe two or three things you think of. Um, And yet it seemed like this was maybe the right time to finally tell that story. Um, One, because uh, I was able to team up with this really amazing producer-director, Peter Marks, Uh, who uh, really has a knack for recreations and was able to bring a great 
animator on board. And so, you know, one of the challenges of telling the story of the Great Chicago Fire is there are no pictures of the fire itself. Mm. Um, you know, there are images of Chicago before the fire. There are images of the aftermath, but nothing of the actual fire itself. And so you need to somehow figure out a way to bring the fire to life. And uh, we were able to do so with the help of these amazing uh, animations and recreations. You know, um, like, like you, Dan, I was Chicago born and raised and going back to grammar school and high school, of course, it was Mrs. Yeah. O'Leary. And, uh, of course, that has been, you know, changed and dispelled. But the yeah. question is, why was there a need to find a scapegoat, which happened to be Mrs. O'Leary, Catholic and Irish, why the scapegoat to even begin with? Yeah, and, and, and I was going to say that was the other reason why it seemed like this story was absolutely worth telling right now is because we do have more and more information about Catherine O'Leary, uh, who she was as a human being, and how she was blamed, which really just felt so relevant now in, in an era where there's a lot of uh, open anti-immigrant uh, hatred being uh being disseminated through the the media, and it just felt like the way in which Catherine O'Leary was scapegoated felt so relevant to our our present moments. Um, You know, when there's something as just cataclysmic as a third of a city burning to the ground, and the reason why the city burned to the ground is really that uh, we as a city were collectively at fault. Um, Now, how so? Uh, because, well, first of all, the city was built almost entirely out of wood, which is not a good good idea for for obvious reasons. And also, there were there were building codes which um, should have present uh, should have prevented a lot of the haphazard construction, and the building codes were not enforced. So, in a way, this you know the, the, these are kind of big picture um, abstract causes of the fire, which kind of place the blame in everyone's lap. And, you know, sometimes it's just easier to uh, blame the least among us. And in 1871, the least among us was Catherine O'Leary. She was an Irish Catholic immigrant in a time when there was really a lot of hatred uh, toward uh, not just any immigrants, but especially Irish Catholic immigrants. It's very Uh, interesting. In reading all the background material for today's program, Mm -hmm. and this may be a far-fetched example, but the whole thing with Catherine O'Leary and the setting the fire, and she's getting the, the, the blame for it, reminds me in 2003 when the city of Chicago blamed Steve Bartman ah. for the Chicago <laughs> Cubs <laughs> yeah. not winning the World right. Series. Because when you think that, about it, no one talks uh-huh. about Gonzalez at shortstop with an error, the left fielder <laughs> pointing to Bartman says with his glove and says, you did it, you stay out of the way. Uh, Dusty Baker never went to the mound to calm down Mark Pryor. None of that's talked about. It was all put on like, Steve Bartman, you cost us a World Series, which is baloney. And so I think the same thing, I mean, this is a far-fetched example, but I love sports and I'm always connecting to that. But uh, I think you can make you can make a comparison there. Yeah, no, ab- absolutely. It's just easier to blame it. It's, it's in, in a way, actually, now that you kind of um, frame it in those terms, and I'm also a Cubs fan, it's um, it, it's not as painful. Like, we, we didn't do this. Our team didn't do this. Like, that guy did it. Exactly. Um, and I think maybe that's there's some solace in having a scapegoat. Good point. Dan, as you, did, uh, as you produced the program and you learned what you learned, uh, what Catholic structures, if any, survived the Chicago fire? Because there was a huge boon in the growth of the church, like in the early 1900s to the 30s and 40s. But from the 70, 1871 until that time, what churches survived? Um, so did, there any, were, did any? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Old St. Pat uh, survived the fire. Actually, really interesting side note. The night before the Great Chicago Fire, there was another fire uh, at a lumber mill uh, just east of Old St. Pat. Wow. Huge fire. And, in fact, that was one of the causes of the Great Fire itself was that the firefighters were exhausted because they'd been up all night fighting this other fire. 
And it's quite possible that that earlier fire, which was just right next, uh, essentially just east of Old St. Pat's, might have saved it um, from the Great Chicago Fire because it had cleared that area of oh. all of the lumber that otherwise might have um, might have destroyed the church. You know, I, ne- um, I never heard this. St- I never no, heard that story before, Dan. Fascinating. In fact, I thought you were going to talk about the Great Fire up in Wisconsin. Uh-huh, about that time, yeah. was that Peshtigo? Yeah. Yeah, and in fact, the Peshtigo fire happened the same night as the Great Chicago Fire, and yet killed in a small town uh, along the Peshtigo River in northeast Wisconsin. That actually killed a lot more people. Uh, the Great Chicago Fire killed about 300. Uh, I don't know the exact number for the Peshtigo Fire, but it was much more deadly. Um, but then the other Catholic structures that survived are St. Ignatius College Prep and Holy Family Church, uh, both next door to each other, which, uh, as a matter of fact, that was the parish where Catherine O'Leary worshipped. Um, beautiful at at church. Holy Family? At Holy Family, yeah. Interesting. Interesting. And this was, a lot of this, it was saved largely because the prevailing winds, and this was part of the reason, actually, what's really very odd is that Right now, we're having this unseasonable, uh, unseasonably hot and dry uh, few, first few days of October. This must have been exactly what it was like. The city had gone months without rain. You know, you can feel what it's like outside right now. It's I think tomorrow it's supposed to be up maybe even close to 80. That's correct. But, and Chicago, usually when it's this uh, hot, it's also humid. But in the fall, it gets dry. You know, you can feel it out there now. You can imagine how a fire might spread really quickly. But the um, there were also these really strong prevailing winds out of the southwest. Mm. Um, and so Holy Family is uh, northwest of where Catherine O'Leary's barn sits. And so the fire blew, uh, the, the wind blew the fire northeast rather than northwest, which spared the church. Spared and the there's church. this legend of uh, Father Arnold Damon the uh, founder of Holy Family was in uh, Brooklyn, New York, when the fire broke out and supposedly uh, prayed to Our Lady of Perpetual Help and said that if the church were spared, he would keep seven lights burning uh, in the church. And they're still and, burning. And they're still burning there today, yeah. We're going to take a little break. WNDZ, 7.50 a.m. on your dial, Catholic Chicago. Phone number is 312-255-8408. When we come back, we'll continue our, this. it's really a fascinating discussion, the Great Chicago Fire, which premieres Friday, October 9th, 8 p.m. on WTTW. Dan Protest will be back in a few minutes, and we want to continue this fascinating conversation. Please stay tuned. Have you checked out Chicago Catholic lately? Either in print or online, Chicago Catholic has informative and stimulating content, including news from the Archdiocese, beautiful photographs, and a thoughtful column by our publisher, Cardinal Blaise Supich. Editor Joyce DeRiga tells us about our current edition of Chicago Catholic. We have an overview of Pope Francis' new encyclical on fraternity and social friendship. Cardinal Supich's column is also dedicated to it. The Archdiocese is urging everyone to get a flu shot this year. We share the details of the campaign, and we have coverage of the recent ordination of permanent deacons. Subscribe now. Go to chicagocatholic.com or call 312-534-7777. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Chicago Catholic, a fresh approach to Catholic news. Do you have a gently used laptop or desktop computer that is gathering dust in your home? Consider donating to our Catholic Charities Veterans Computer Project. We will clean out your device, give it new software, and repurpose it for a veteran who is looking for employment. Your gift will make an incredible difference in a veteran's ability to find a job. Catholic Charities provides veteran services throughout Lake and suburban Cook Counties, giving participants an array of professional and personal support. Our veterans have served our country, and it is our privilege to serve them. To learn more about Catholic Charities Veterans Services and the Veterans Computer Project, call 847-782-4219. That's 847-782-4219. Catholic Charities Veterans Services. 
That's 847-782-4219. You're invited to Keep Hope Alive 2020, the online benefit and celebration of the Archdiocese of Chicago's Immigration Ministry and their nationwide program, Pastoral Migratoria. Join us virtually on the evening of Thursday, October 29th for a night filled with music, camaraderie, and inspiring speakers. Cardinal Blaise Supich and Sister Norma Pimentel of Catholic Charities of the Rio Grande Valley, who was recently recognized as one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People, will be joining us to help keep hope alive. Now, more than ever, the immigrant community, both here in the Archdiocese of Chicago and across the United States, needs the leadership formation and accompaniment that Pastoral Migratoria provides. Registration is free, and sponsorship and advertising opportunities are available. Visit www.keephopealive2020.org for more information and to register. Again, that's www.keephopealive2020.org. Welcome back to Catholic Chicago on WNDZ 750. Our phone number 312-255-8408. Father Greg Sacklitz and Mark Treacy. And our guest is Dan Protest, executive producer, WTPW. And the Great Chicago Fire premieres tomorrow evening, October 9th at 8 p.m. on WTTW. Let's listen to another short clip. Catherine and Patrick worship nearby at Holy Family Parish with the dynamic Jesuit leader Arnold Damon. He established St. Ignatius College next door and founded the church to serve immigrant families like the O'Leary's. They had their children baptized at the church and they created a place of great beauty with their nickels and dimes. And yet because of their dedication to the church, Irish immigrants were eyed with suspicion by Chicago's Protestant elite. The Irish were America's first urban ethnic underclass because the whole idea, and maybe even ideal, of American identity is that anyone can come here and be an American. All you have to do is reject your home country, leave it behind, and then you're one of us. And Catholics were perceived as being unable to do that because of their loyalty to the Pope. It's interesting, interesting clip. Uh, I was up at Munline Seminary. Um, for 15 years, and it's a seminary of 17 buildings, American colonial. Cardinal Mundelein built a seminary campus to reflect the idea that Catholics, immigrant Catholics can be good Americans. Um, he saw that, and that was 30, 40 years after the Chicago Because the seminary, he built it and started in 1917, and the doors right. opened in 1921. So we're looking at Irish and Italian immigrants, and it was anti-Catholic sentiment, also an anti-immigrant settlement uh, by the what did what have you learned in terms of that arena uh, because Irish did not apply here so that wasn't Catholic that was secular but it's interrelated yeah no absolutely uh, Bill Savage the historian we just heard from and the the other historian who was just amazing on this subject is Ellen Skerritt who's writing mm-hmm. a history of Holy Family Parish right now um, yeah I mean Part of it was uh, ethnic and, you know, remains throughout American history ethnic. Uh, Italians didn't come until largely uh, until after the fire, but you read all kinds of accounts of their strange foods. Or even, you know, more recently I've interviewed uh, Mexican-Americans about Mexican-American history, and you hear about um, how their classmates would say, tortillas, ew, what's that, Mm -hmm. you know, um, and food um, and other facets of culture are often a target for uh, hatred. Uh, But, yeah, certainly, as Bill Savage just said, the idea was you couldn't possibly be loyal to both the Pope and to the United States. Um, and, you know, when you read newspaper accounts, if there's one way you can learn about the anti-Irish Catholic sentiment of the time, it's by reading the Chicago Tribune from the time, um, which was published by Joseph Medill, who then actually, after the fire, 
becomes mayor of Chicago. Um, and the, the ways in which they describe Irish Catholics are just almost cartoonish. You know, they're strange ways and, um, you know, lots of uh, cheap shots about alcoholism and, you know, they, there's no way they can possibly be the good Americans that um, Protestants can be. Because part, part of the context here is that Chicago was ruled at the time by what was known as the prairie aristocracy. And these were uh, Protestants largely from the East Coast, from places like New York, who had come to Chicago to make their fortunes. And in fact, Medill himself was, was uh, of Irish extraction, but uh, Protestant. And um, in fact, then after the fire, um, the Dill runs for mayor on this, what he calls the fireproof party ticket. Mm -hmm. And one of the first laws that he enacts uh, actually implicitly targets Irish and German. That, that was, Germans were the other uh, large immigrant group in Chicago at the time, Irish and, and German immigrant populations, by uh, prohibiting the construction of wood frame buildings in the city center, um, which were the kind of building methods that were favored by the Irish and German immigrants. Now, Dan, in all your research, what were some of the findings that really surprised and shocked you? Because you think, we all think we know stuff about the Chicago Fire of 1871. Mm -hmm. You've given some tremendous background and things I had never heard of. But in all your findings, what was like, oh, my God, I never knew this? Um. You know, well, first of all, I, what I do not know, I knew that the Chicago City Council had cleared Catherine O'Leary in 1997. What I didn't know is that she'd been cleared in her lifetime. Uh, in 1872, the year after the fire, she'd been cleared. Oh. And so this myth persisted despite the fact that she had been officially cleared uh, by the commission that investigated the causes of the fire. I, it also just kind of clarified for me the timeline and geography of the fire. You know, a lot of people think, oh, what did it, you know, fire must have lasted for five, six hours. No, it lasted for basically a day and a half. Uh, started the night of October 8th and burned into the morning of October 10th. And it, to consider the geography of it, if you, if you know the present-day geography of Chicago, it's unbelievable how far it spread. What were the boundaries, Dan, for this fire? So Catherine O'Leary's barn was at just north of DeCoven Street, just north of Roosevelt, uh, around Des Plaines. The Ironically enough, the Chicago Fire Academy is there now, where um, hmm. would-be Chicago firefighters uh, get their training. And, and so that, of course, is somewhat contained by the Chicago River, uh, but in fact, the fire jumped the river twice. One uh, jumped the river from west to east, so Catherine O'Leary was on um, what then was known uh, as the west side. Jumped the fire to the east and spread through what's now downtown Chicago. Then jumped the main branch of the river, jumped the river again to, to the north side. And then the, the north side was really the hardest hit by the fire, um, obviously, we know it burned a path through where the water tower is because that famously survived the fire, but burned all the way to Fullerton, Fullerton and wow. Clark, wow. which is really far, yeah, quite a distance. Because interesting, Holy Name Cathedral, where I rector, um, it burned down. It was not the cathedral then, but when it burned down in October, then took four years and one month to rebuild the, cathedral, the Holy Name, which then became the cathedral. So you're right. It, it devastated this area in the heart of downtown. And, mm -hmm. and when you think about it, a day and a half in dry conditions, that fire must have been relentless. Yeah. And, you you know, you see the images coming out of California and Oregon now. That's, you know, it kind of gives you a sense of what it must have been like. And there are all these accounts of people who um, would – First of all, had no idea the fire was coming their way, just assumed that this was going to be contained to this small area, and so weren't, um, you know, her, her grabbing their possessions and, and rushing uh, as far away from the fire as possible. Instead, they were stopping to look at the fire because they were just 
uh, it was almost like a form of entertainment. As it was getting closer. Time. We need to bring this to a close, Dan. I can't believe how fast this half hour went. I want to yes. thank in a very special way Dan Protest, executive producer, WTV, and the great Chicago Fire premieres tomorrow evening, October 9th at 8 p.m. on WTTW. It is a must-watch for every Chicagoan. Dan, thank you very much. You've been a tremendous guest, and God bless you. I'm a White Sox fan. You're a Cubs fan. But may God bless you anyway. You're on the right side of the street, Dan. Because <laughs> Mark's a big Cubs fan. So I want to thank in a special way also uh, Mark Teresi. Great being with you today, Mark. And thank a great job of our producer, Vince Gerasoli, and great work of our engineer, Michael May. To all, may God bless all of you. Stay safe. Also, Brian. Oh, Brian, hockey hitman Brock is also with us back here. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> to all, God bless. Go Chicago Bears. Join us every Monday through Friday at this time for Catholic Chicago. You can stream our programs live or listen to past programs by visiting our website, archchicago.org, and clicking on Radio TV. And please connect with Catholic Chicago on social media.